everybody. Welcome to another episode of Crush Live Poker. I'm your host here, Bart Hansen, and uh, we've got new footage. I'm excited. If you don't watch the uh, Crush Live 08 videos, I, I put out uh, one last week, but we have permission to use uh, Jacksonville Best Bet footage now, and this actually really excites me. I talked a little bit about on the podcast this past week. I've watched a few of these episodes, and this stream has actually been going on for quite some time, a couple of years, but it's on a more regular basis now. And this is really representative, I feel like, of casino poker, at least at the small to low stakes. I haven't necessarily gone and looked at the very sort of their 5, 10, 20 games, but I always want to err towards you know putting out training content that applies to most of the people that are on Crush Live Poker. This particular episode actually is just, you know, great for in terms of like the quality of play, some of the mistakes that were made, things like that. As always, you can email me at bart at crushlivepoker.com, bart at crushlivepoker.com. And of course, you can check out the forums over at the homepage and you can click on the little chat icon below the player to get into a discussion about this particular episode. You can also follow along. They put up their entire streams on their YouTube and their Twitch channel. Best Bet Live, you can do a search for it. This particular night came from uh, August 8th. I'll give you guys the time codes. But this was 2-5 Deep Stack. This is much more representative of a real game. And this kind of excites me because I've been really looking for this type of footage <laughs> for quite some time. So I'm really excited about the new relationship that we're going to have with Jacksonville Best Bet. I am actually probably going to be, actually I am going down there to play in their bounty event right around the time of my 40th birthday, which I believe is, well, my birthday is the 16th, but um, the 12th or the 13th that weekend, I'm actually going to be one of the featured bounties down there. So I'm going to be headed down there. You can shoot me an email. Some people have already asked me, hey, you know, when you go on these trips, do you do meetups? I don't know how many people there are in Northern Florida, but from what I've seen in this live stream, I mean, the games are, are really good in terms of no limit. I will continue to do sample stuff from Live of the Bike for YouTube. I'm actually looking for suggestions. People can email me with hands that they think are a good fit to go over for YouTube. So let's get into it. Now, I don't know any of the players besides the fact that I watched, you know, the entire episode looking for hands. So I, I, I sort of know that we can, seat number five was V pipping very, very hard and very, very high. His name is Eric, and, uh, you know, we'll get into some of the other things too, but the chip colors are the same as we see in L.A. Reds are fives, greens are 25s. Didn't see any real hundreds on the table, and I'm going to be going and hitting up a lot of hands because this is either going to be a two- or three-part episode. It's probably going to be three parts all over this particular hand. And this is a four-hour stream, right? So how many hands are you going to get in? Like 120? How are we going to do three shows over this episode. Well, there are so many mistakes that are made just over and over and over again that I think that this is going to be a good back to basics type of hand review. And, you know, we're going to go in linear order. So, but I would definitely watch the entire thing, you know, in terms of not necessarily hitting up on like one specific you know, type of concept here. You can see the stack sizes. The action tracking was pretty, pretty accurate. I, I was pretty impressed. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the buy-in caps are, or I, I think it would, maybe it was 1500 and the hands are straddled some of the time too, right? So, I mean, let's just get into it here. We have Eric, one of the few times where the card reader's not picking up with 1260, I told you he was like V-pipping really high, opens for a raise. Again, Obviously, sort of in, you know, this is almost like a typical kind of small 2-5 game is what I would say with these stack sizes. I wouldn't really call this like a deep, deep 2-5 game. But again, conceptually, you usually want to play a solid preflop game would be a 3-better fold early versus early to drive out the rest of the field. Obviously, you can do 15, 25, 35 times, which is like old school, like, hey, can I make 25 times off the raise, fill with 9, 8 of hearts, but the new school, 15, 25, 35, the podcast that I updated, really, you want to be looking at your position, um, and if it's close, you want to pitch 
the suited connector from up front versus early because you've got so many people behind you, especially at a live loose game. You know, it's just going to be very, very hard to play and very hard to realize with people calling behind you. So it would probably be a three or better fold. I acknowledge that the stacks would be sort of strange. I mean, you know, you're going to make it 65 and I mean, it's 100 big blinds, right? Basically, but with live poker, everyone's using larger sizing. So, you know, we've got a queen jack offsuit call. Then we've got the cutoff here, your primary sort of three bet bluff hand. I didn't really see many people three bet bluff actually at all, but this is the one that uh, usually is in the charts as one that you're almost always three bet bluffing here, especially when it goes raise with a wide V pip call call. You've got dead money out there. Definitely profitable to make this, you know, like a hundred from the cutoff something like that he just calls and then we see this cascade so this is great like multi multi-way live representative casino poker type of type of action here so pots 105 and here we go to the flop and it's ace king jack with a couple of hearts so you can see here that phil has flopped a flush draw with nine eight of hearts and also you can see how difficult it is to actually play this with one two th basically even just two people behind you um, to the point where when Eric comes out and bets and we're actually never going to see Eric's hand here. I think that this can be just a fold. Uh, I mean, it's almost a pot size bet. He bet 80. You've got two guys behind you like a dry flush draw like this on a connected Broadway board. If you're playing sort of a suited connector that you didn't three bet off like five, six, six, seven, this is exactly why these hands go down in value from early position with people behind you, you should just fold. This should be just a fold here. I mean, this is the definition of a dry flush draw here. Um, Phil's going to make the call. Going to get folded around here to Robert here in the cutoff with ace five. Now, again, you wouldn't, you know, obviously you don't know. Well, we would just make the assumption that we don't know. Let's say we don't know the player, so we don't know Eric is really be pipping high. But obviously, you know, when it goes bet 80 call ace five of clubs no backdoor you know if you're looking for an excuse to like continue on against small sizing against a, a bet and a call look for your backdoor flush draw. i'm fine with this fold here in fact like i think that this might even be a um i mean it's probably close i mean you can just see the power of position I, I would take either hand in this guy's position but bet call um i think this is a fold now if i had nine eight of hearts and i went bet call i would be more apt to call in position as opposed to next to act but I'm fine with this fold. So he makes the fold, and uh, we go to the turn here, and the turn here is the four of spades, and now Eric's going to check. One of the things that I think that you need to recognize, I mean, obviously this hand is a little bit, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for somebody to basically see bet into three people with absolutely nothing. But I will say from reviewing the footage, one of the things, and I don't know if Northern Florida poker is behind, there were there was a lot of mindless sea betting with no regard to number of players, no regard to the actual equity in your hand. So I can look at this spot in two different ways. When a guy opens from plus one and bets into three or four people, he's usually going to be pretty strong when he's sea betting, right? Which is part of the reason why I would probably just fold off the nine eight of hearts. Now, if I had called though, and he's checking the turn, that's going to mean that he doesn't have ace king, ace jack, and um, a lot of players are just going to continue to bet with ace queen and ace ten. So if you were to look at this position or this particular hand, not like it actually happened, but you know maybe one raise and a call and you call with nine eight of hearts like on the button and the guy c bets this flop you call and then they check the turn i think that gives you a green light to bet because i don't think that he's going to be checking a lot of hands especially if you're against a guy that doesn't have a lot of thought in their c bet sort of bluffing or you know who's sort of over c bet bluffing you could certainly bet here with a flush draw now if somebody is very knowledgeable of what's going on, it's a higher stakes game. Certainly there might be checking to check call here. This is a little bit interesting though. And I think that this game sort of falls into a category of these guys are betting their hands straight forward. They're protecting against the draws, which might just lead me towards a bet here. Like I don't even know if an ace is going to check here all that much. So I think with that sort of knowledge of exploit, I would probably bet. If I didn't know that, then I would probably check because I would make the assumption that the preflop raiser must have something when he bets in and raises from plus one and bets in to three or four people, right? You would think 
that he's not just doing it with total air. You have the hearts. He doesn't have the hearts, and it looks like he's going to check to check call. So you can sort of go either way with it. That So, I mean, there's no right answer. I think it depends on the lineup, depends on the flow, you know, things like that. That's what I would be thinking in different lineups. Now, the river's a queen here, and this is kind of interesting. So Eric checks again. So he bet into three or four people, checked the turn, and now checks the river. He's obviously not going to have a 10 here uh, when people play it normally kind of straightforward. So he checks, and now Phil, who's basically left – you know, with one of the absolute worst hands he's going to have, he's going to throw out a bet here. And I don't really know what to think about this just because he bets a hundred here. So he gives himself a pretty good price. Uh, you know, he's betting a hundred into 265. So he, you know, the bluff only has to work like 28% of the time. You know, if it, if you bet half pot is 33, he's even betting less than half pot. But I will say, even though we don't see Eric's hand, it's hard for me when you're looking at a low stakes game. It's hard sometimes if I'm an Eric spot, if I had played this hand this way for me to fold uh, like a single pair of ace. Like if I had raised with ace five and decided to bet the flop and check the turn because it's next act called and I ran out of value. I don't think that most players are betting two pair here. So this becomes a polarized spot. It's like two pair or nothing. I mean, excuse me, it's a straight or nothing here. And then when you look at this, and again, you got to look at the quality of player how, next to act having a 10 would have to make a call with like king 10, jack 10, queen 10 of course would be the nuts, which would probably be bet off on the turn if it was slow played. So, or ace 10 that might check back. So, I mean, it's hard if the player in position is going to be betting off ace 10 on the turn. He literally, and then also queen 10 he's literally going to have to have king 10 or jack 10 um if he's betting ace 10 on the turn like that's it or 10x of hearts that doesn't raise the flop which you know obviously is possible and checks back the turn takes a card that's a pretty thin value range you're not supposed to have those offsuit broadway hands next to act pre-flop of course there's a huge deviation and people might have them but eric's going to end up folding here but I, if I was in Eric's spot and I had some sort of showdown value and I had bet, especially if I had bet like with ace 10, like two or three handed, I would have a very, very hard time folding here, knowing that in typical mid to low stakes live no limit on a run out like this, this bet is only a 10. So it's a very polarized bet by definition, right? Um, you're, just, you're not going to see somebody bet king queen here. I mean, it's po I mean, if I had ace queen here and played it this way in this guy's spot, I would bet at the end, but... You know, you guys aren't going to, you're just not going to see that all that much. All right, let's take a look here at our next hand. This one comes from about 21, 21 and 45 minutes in. And you can see, like, this is like a typical, like, live sort of like 1-3 game that we don't get to analyze, which I, I really like because we're going to see a lot of limbs. You see a guy limp in here with Jack-8 off with a $155 stack. I mean, this is just like, you know, clear-cut low stakes stuff that you'll see in casino so we have an iso raise here with seven eight off definitely would not recommend that not only just quality of hand with a short stack in there you're going to be you know sort of paralyzed by their stack and i used to play sloppy like this a lot you know at commerce in 510 in the late 2000s but i know i wouldn't do it over you know i would iso shitty hands like this before we sort of before i sort of people you know kind of caught on to pre-flop but you don't want to do that um, against short stacks. So Phil here is going to call on the button. Now, surprisingly, Queen Jack, especially against a wide open here, is probably on the cusp of a call. Now, this isn't an anti game, but you know, you guys, you know, obviously you're familiar with my training recently in the last year that the better the hand, the more you want a three bet. Like a suited hand would be a slam dunk three bet here. But you could, you can do a fair amount of calling. You have a wide calling range against basically a late position open. Now, it's different, though, because there was a limper in there. And the limper at low stakes might limp re-raise. So there's nothing wrong with folding. But if it went straight cut off open, um, you can call. Yeah, you could 3-bet sometimes, too. But I, I, would, I definitely think you can call. So here the board comes out king 4-5. I mean, this is just like... If you're going to open the cutoff with 7e, you can't get a better type of board here to throw out a c-bet here. 
Um, and then, you know, from the flip side, we'll, we're going to see a few of these hands here too. Talking about not only we're talking about constructing, you know, how how we've properly constructed continuation bet ranges, you know, betting after you have the preflop raiser and what what are you looking for? In a lot of live low stakes games, you can sort of construct a field bet when the preflop raiser checks to you. So it's constructing a field bet. When a lot of players play unbalanced like they do and they're going to bet off a fair amount of top pairs, if this guy is betting most of his kings here and you've got queen jack, you've got backdoor equity and even if you were to have like a pair, you've got two overcards plus position. I mean, what you'd really want to be looking for is like queen jack suited with a backdoor. You know, something like that. But I would rather say like take a hand like this and start a bluff to get him off of some equity than say to like bet, you know, a hand like ace nine, something like that. Ace nine, no backdoor, you know, something like that, um, which has some showdown value and you don't really have a whole lot going for it like in the backdoor. So look for your backdoors as, as the field caller too. It's the same concept as being a continuation better if the preflop raiser so now checks to you. So if I had 7-8 here, I mean, I would <laughs> I would definitely would have bet the flop and I would have double barreled the turn. I mean, what more can you ask for? Um, queen Jack is also interesting too if you play it from the opposite end. If you bet with Queen Jack as the field caller when the preflop raiser checked and they're usually not going to have a king... Normally at the like low stakes, you're not going to see guys make calls with like ace, 10, ace, jack. I would double barrel this card too here with queen, jack. And a lot of times people are just going to fold out sevens and eights. Now, if the guy goes call, call, you can decide whether or not as the field caller, you're going to continue to bet. But it's all about exploitable play here at these stakes. Check, check uh, once again. And I feel like when the flop goes check, check, if you didn't bet queen, jack, you have an absolute green light to bet the turn to bet off the pairs. Because if you look at a scenario, and let's say you had like a, a viable hand that you checked the flop with from Eric's perspective, which was the preflop raiser and the cutoff like tens, and it went check, check, you're checking the turn. And if a guy bets on the turn, it's pretty cool. He's going to have a lot of offsuit aces here when people love to play like, you know, ace X. When you're up against a guy that's going to be calling ace X off, any ace X off in a certain configuration, they're going to have a lot of aces. So, you know, nines on the turn when you check again, it's going to be a hard call to make, and a lot of guys aren't going to make that call. So, I would bet here with Queen Jack. I mean, yeah, you have the nut no pair, but the way that this hand is played out when normally people are going to usually bet with nothing even though this is sort of an outside case where the 7-8 should have bet bet, um, you're going to get like 6s, 7s, 8s, 9s, a lot of time to fold. It goes check, check again. River now is a 7, so it's gotten checked all the way down. And uh, this is a very thin value bet here. He's going to bet 30, and he's not going to get a call. Uh, and that's just sort of just goes to show you that I, I think this particular player thought that this guy was going to bet off. So a seven here was like the nuts. Now I think it's probably overly optimistic that you're going to get called by worse in that spot, like with a four or a five. But I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, let's go to the next hand here, which is uh, at just about twenty three thirty. So this is the very very next hand here, um, and we are going to see here. We're going to see a raise by Zach here with pocket tens five which is you know a pretty big open some of these hands were straddled this one was not it was just a straight 30 so a straight set I mean like I said this is old school right you know he's got tens he's trying to do it um you know to protect so he makes it 35 Chris here plus one ace queen of hearts makes the call and again you know Three bet. I mean, he's really, really short here. Thirty-five dollar raise at one twenty. If you're playing this short, which is basically like you know twenty-one blinds, hopefully you're not. You would just want to shove. If we were playing like norm, normal stack, again, definitely can three bet, can call as well. 
Um, we're going to get a call here from Phil with 9-8 of diamonds. This is a hand that I might overcall. It might not be quite good enough to squeeze, but again, you're not giving up that much with a lot of this preflop stuff like squeezing to get people out. If you're not comfortable, you're giving up a little bit in the fact that you're probably going to get a lot of folds, but if you're not comfortable playing 3-bet pots and very, very short SPRs, it's definitely going to increase you know, your variance. But I do want you to know that if it was a higher stakes game, a lot of people would 3-bet off against a raise and a call um, as a squeeze, especially if the guy calling in between is V-pipping high. So call, call here. And again, like if you were to play the game of 15 times, um, yeah, you're pre excuse me, 25 times with the suited connector. It's it's probably pretty close, right? I mean, you probably need like what 700, 800, and Phil's really not that deep. Going for a non nut draw, nine eight suited doesn't you know is troublesome when it interacts with the broadways. So against this size and a call. I don't think there's anything wrong with folding. And finally, one other thing of note that a lot of people might not think about is when you have a guy that's basically called off a large portion of his stack and you're overcalling him. So in this case, 35 call, the guy's got 120. If you, if the preflop raiser bets the flop, if you get something somewhat favorable in the form of a draw, you could get jammed on by the second guy. I mean, this guy's so shallow, it's actually not going to represent that much more. But say the guy had, like, 200, and now the pot's 100, and the preflop raiser, like, bet 50. You're going to see that second guy basically fold or move all in. So it becomes even more of a fold when you're overcalling somebody short because there's that added extra variable that the short stack is going to move all in on the flop and then even when the preflop raiser checks the short stack just might take the approach of betting and there's not going to be any fold equity because they're so short a lot of people don't think about that preflop is the name of the game you know in this particular in this particular uh you know at this level so you know you can revert back to 15 25 35 and again that's the issue here with squeezing like if you make it like 150 you know a lot of people are are going to just, you know, raise or fold. And if you're in those particular scenarios, you might even actually look for the blocker type hands to three better fold. But pot now is 112. And uh, Zach here is going to make a little protection bet. There's not a whole lot to this hand, but I wanted to point out those little things. Again, Chris should have just moved all in pre because obviously part of the reason we're getting to be able to move all in pre here, you get some fold equity and then you get to see a hand like this where you're not bet off your equity, right? I mean, he's got two overcards and a backdoor flush draw and a backdoor straight draw, and he's bet off his equity by not jamming. And and again, I say when I looked at this, I feel like a lot of the play here is very, very indicative of low stakes or, you know, I, I would be surprised to see a game this soft in LA at 2-5. Against this sizing here of 55, even though it's multi-way, especially on a board like this that is really dry, you can't hand pick a, like a, a better call with your back doors here as a float besides having like queen jack of diamonds now yes the guy's betting into two people which means he's somewhat stronger but look for look for the types of hands that can turn backdoor equity against small sizing he bet 55 um into 110 i mean about about half the size of the pot but if i'm closing the action here i'm gonna call two overcards a second pair backdoor flush draw three to a flush that sort of wrap around nine eight seven type of thing remember you can't call in the middle though with someone behind you which is why when we go back to that first hand why nine eight suited calling from utg plus one is so troublesome because with a lot of loose people calling behind you you can't make these peels but when you are closing the action certainly that's what you want to look for with your back door all right, let's take a look here at the next hand, which comes at about 34.30. So, I mean, already we're 20 minutes into this thing, and there are spots to just talk about here. So, Phil here with a 620 stack has pocket queen. It's going to open to straight 30, which, again, is a huge open. Chuck here, plus two calls, king, queen of clubs. Zach in the hijack here with jacks. Again, this is just one of these spots where... You could 
I mean, usually you're going to be three betting king queen suited from plus two. Gains yourself position over the field. It's such a huge size. It is uh, certainly, you know, going to put some people who are inexperienced post flop in in some weird spots. Jacks, I feel like, is too good to, to not squeeze here with the dead money out there. You know, you want to get it more shorthanded, drive the other people out, drive the flat caller out. I would be squeezing here for sure, unless for some reason UTG was like some sort of like ridiculous OMC. You can see obviously small blind King 10 off is not a call. And um, we're going to see it four ways here at 125 bucks. Seven do six here with a couple of spades. So Queens here with the overpair and this is just exactly what you don't want to do here in this spot, which is basically bet pot and get every hand out there to fold that you want to get value from in this spot. Now, what's tricky here about this particular stream is that I did see some mindless sea betting from a lot of different guys where they would sea bet ace queen of hearts here. Now, maybe not necessarily for this sizing, but Coming over to Zach here, I have made exploitable folds like this before. If it's close, again, you would probably want to look for your backdoor here. Like, you know, if you were 50-50 to fold off here, Jax, he doesn't have a spade in his hand. So, you know, fold off the ones that don't have spades in them. Um, eights, nines, tens. I mean, you can think about calling linearly down. Eights, nines at least can turn some additional equity if you're behind here too. So it's really quite interesting when you're looking at a situation where if Phil's range here on the flop, if we could really peg his range down to being like ace-king and then queens, kings, and aces, you would rather have like eights or nines with a spade in it than have jacks here. Because his outs, you know, he's got just as many outs with ace-king versus jacks here. And when you're behind, you can pick up additional equity, right? If you have uh, eights or nines with a spade in it. So, you know, this is a spot where sometimes people confuse it and they're like, well, I'm going to call with some of my better hands. Of course, that, that you know, you have to sometimes take into account, well, would he ever be making this bet, you know, into like four or five people with a hand like nines or tens or something like that. But I think we've seen like the OMC types. I don't know these guys really all that well, but if it was an OMC type, you want to start thinking about those other things as opposed to just calling down linearly thinking, especially in the beginning of the hand. So jacks without a spade here with this guy betting pot into three or four people. He just lets it go. I didn't see really lay, set, lay downs like this throughout this whole stream, but give this guy credit. And again, you just don't want to put yourself into a situation. It's not even way, way ahead, way behind. How about get some value from your hands? You know, if jacks is folding out here, by the way, too, like, you know, the same thing could be said where, especially when we talk about this sometimes in three-bet pots, it's better to sometimes have a five-out draw, like a hand like ace-seven suited here, as opposed to a pair, because you have more outs. Ace-seven of clubs here, which is like, you know, a five-out draw with a back door, something like that, um, might even be better than a, to a pot size bet than, say, jacks without you know, without a spade in it, but, but don't go insane and make these like huge, huge, huge bets and not get any value from anything. So the next hand here we're going to go to is, um, at about 41 50 here. And we're going to see a limped pot. And you guys know that I love limp pots here. Well, I didn't see any bomb pots here from Jacksonville, but I do want to uh, know, like, for you guys that are from Northern Florida, definitely email me and tell me if this is a typical 2-5 to, like, 1-3 type of level, or if this was something that was very, very special. So it's going to get limped around here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Eight-way action here. It's kind of interesting. It's almost like a little bit like an anti-game when you're on the button here with King-8 offsuit getting, like, I'm not going to call with King 8's offsuit, but you could definitely call with a pretty wide range here when it's like, lim I mean, you're getting 7, 8 to 1 specifically on the button. Here, we see Zach 
and uh, he's got a set of fives, bottom set here. Robert here is in the big blind and checked his option, and uh, he is just going to lead out here with a seven of clubs, which I think is a little bit optimistic. I think it's really probably too thin, even though if Zach didn't have a set, he actually would have an ace, and I have certainly been known to lead out. I advocate leading out with top pair a lot more than other people do, but once it gets to a certain level, like six, seven seven hands you're up against a lot of different cards here now if you're up against like three people and there was no raise pre-flop and the board is textured and get calls from draws call from queens something like that you could even go bet bet check but uh, up against six or seven people i think you have to rein it in a little bit now you guys know that i'm obviously a huge huge fan of fast playing this guy's gonna bet out 35 so he bets out basically the size of the pot which might have something to do with the the, the reason why Zach decided to play it this way, um, where he's actually going to raise. But what I would probably do here, if I had, say, open limped a small pair, which I don't really do at my games, at my levels, but, you know, there's an argument to be made in loose, small stakes, live games, where you could limp with some small pairs, limp with some small suited aces. It's interesting because I had you know, discussion with Dave Tuckman way back when, squished my tomato, played a lot of 5-5. Five five. If you're playing like a deeper stack 5-5, five five, those guys like to open their pairs to basically build a pot up when they hit a set. Or they said that people would be more willing to lose more money in a raise pot than a limp pot, right? But I can see a play sometimes for limping in small pocket pairs. I would slow play here. And the reason why I would slow play here is because of the fact that the big blind doesn't usually fare to have uh, ace-king or ace-queen here. And if you raise, like it goes 35 and you make it 100, a lot of people are just going to fold out their aces. You want an ace to call. You want some idiot to call, over call with a queen. So it's a configuration issue. You guys know I'm a huge, huge fan of fast playing. And if it went bet call call and we were on the button sure i would raise but because we're next to act it's almost a little bit too strong who cares if the draws come in they're transparent you want them to come in you've got a set they're like three to one dog against you and it's transparent don't be scared of the draws try to think about getting the most amount of value from your hands now on the flip side it is a big bet so something could be said where they're like, well, yeah, but the guy's betting really big, like in eight ways, he probably should have a really strong hand. Well, obviously he doesn't. My counter argument to that would be we're blocking a fair amount of the strong hands, right? Because when we said that he's not going to have ace, queen, aces, queens, because those hands are going to be raised out of the blind, we have the fives. So there's only one five left in the deck. So it's really hard for somebody to have two pair here when they would have to have a five in their hand to have the two pair, right? Because they're going to raise with ace-queen. They're not going to have aces and queens. We've got three of the fives. So it's kind of hard. I mean, that's some deep, deep sort of analysis, but that's really the way that I would think about it here. A lot of amateur players and stuff like that in the field, I would probably pull this hand instead of raise it up to 90. Now, maybe Zach has a... You know, he could say that, well, people are going to call with an ace behind me anyways. It is a limp pot, though. People know, hey, don't go broke in limp pots. Obviously, Robert has a very, very easy just bet fold. But I actually think in that spot, it might be a little bit too strong. Now, what you could do is pull like a min raise. Like it went, thir you know, I, I'm always a fan of that, too. Like it went 35 to 90. So he did make it small. I mean, he made it less than 3x. But you could literally sometimes min raise. Make it look like you have an ace, and sometimes the people with the draws behind you are going to call anyways. And obviously, you got to you know be able to do the hand reading, proceed with caution if one of the draws come out. But that that would be my particular thinking in a spot like that. Flopping a set, getting everybody to come in behind you, and then because and then because of the board texture, knowing that no one's going to have probably the top two pair or a really strong hand that can give you a lot of action just because of the preflop nature. You know, it's a little bit different, you know, if the board came out like nine deuce five, that is a quite a dynamic board. So that's an, again, an, you know, another situation where 
you might get nines and stuff behind you to fold. Um, but I think in this particular spot, it, it could be a little bit too strong. The next hand is going to come from an hour, and so we're going to skip ahead. I mean, I couldn't go over every every single hand, but there's something to be said, <laughs> almost like in, you know, in a lot of in a lot of these hands. So this hand comes from one hour and 23 minutes in to the show. Again, you guys know that I love attacking the field better. Limped pots. It's always the same type of concept here. So limps around here, and uh, Charlie is going to raise it up here to 20. One of the other things, too, that is really, you know, kind of a very, very basic thing, but it holds true quite a bit. When you see, like, a pot sweetener type of raise, meaning that, you know, two or three people have limped in and a guy makes it 15 or 20, where you know that they're not going to do it with aces or kings. If you want to experiment with three betting, if you're not really you know, all that well-versed and you're not necessarily comfortable playing three-bet pots and you do it with mostly value, but you want to experiment with three-bet bluffing, this is a great time to do it when you recognize that someone has basically telegraphed the strength of their hand based upon their bet sizing, their preflop sizing with multiple limps in front. So two limps and this guy makes it 20. He's never really going to have a real hand here at these stakes, people are kind of scared, you know, think about jacks, queens, kings, aces. So I would take a hand like seven, six suited here in the big blind, which is going to get, which is obviously going to, you know, be promoted from getting it heads up anyways. And I would three bet off here. Like I would make it 75, 80, something like that. Now, probably Charlie's going to call with the 10, eight suited, but I think you can start to see, you know, where I'm going. He makes it 20, seven, six suited calls. And again, seven, six suited with, I mean, not only you're trying to drive the people out behind you so that you can, it's very, very hard to realize this hand with being out of position with two people to your left that are going to call 20. You call, of course, the limpers aren't going to fold for 15 more if they already limped in. Right. I mean, look at this garbage here. Ace four offsuit, Jack eight offsuit. This is like a bicycle, probably one, three game. I mean, that's what it is. And we don't see that represented all that much in live streams anymore. I mean, the live stream games are home games. That's why this kind of excites me. So King Jack 9. Actually, this isn't attacking the field better. This is when we're the preflop raiser. But it's going to get checked over to Eric. I don't know why Eric here is going to decide to lead. But if you flop, you know, a draw here, which is what Charlie does. He also has a backdoor spade draw. Bottom end of open-ended here, which is going to, you know, going to... um have, uh, you know, going to want to drive people out here. So he's going to make it 100. And I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of that play as well. Now, if you flopped like a nut hand here, you know, it would depend on like what a lead out range is here. But it's not surprising that you see people sort of donk out here, kind of trying to find out where they're at. And that's why you can attack it's not really attacking the field better here it's as the preflop raiser basically just tacking a lead here i mean 30 into 100 on this board and eric actually was pretty active pre played a lot of hands so he's not gonna have like kings jacks nines i mean at the best maybe like a hand like jack nine which would be like bottom two but of course you have equity and you could continue on even if the guy three bet you, I mean, may, I mean, depends. You wouldn't want to continue on to a bet three bet all in, but that's going to be rare. So, that's a good little pickup. Any type of hand as the preflop raiser with some sort of equity against a weak lead, especially with a not the best draw that's going to promote itself by, you know, bumping some of the people out. Um, I definitely do. Uh, I definitely like that play. Let's go on here to one thirty five which I found pretty interesting because this is kind of rare that you'll see this. This is uh, actually a straddle pot here. So you can see here that Eric is in the straddle and he has ace deuce. So he flops it and uh, he's going to lead out here tiny. And one of the reasons why I picked this particular hand is uh, we don't see what the guy to his left has, but he bets 10. Phil's going to raise. 
we're going to see a call here from Chuck in seat six, I believe, here with king six suited. Jeff over here is going to call with four or five, which is a gut shot, which is really a, obviously a, uh, Chuck is over here in seat eight, which is kind of a disaster because of the fact that you could still have somebody that has a deuce who might bet you're not closing the action. I mean, that's just basic, like, no limit conceptual type of thing here. I mean, if I were to take this particular hand here with 4-5, especially if I had, like, a backdoor, and it went, like, bet 10 from the straddle where we don't think that somebody's, like, leading out, right? All that much, and then next to act makes it 30. Could be having a 6. We don't think anyone's going to really have a, many deuces. The thing is, is that this guy calling, remember it went bet, raise, call, would just make me want to fold. But if it went, again, I love them pots, right? If it went bet sort of small raise here, I think I might take like a hand like this and check raise three bet with it. I mean, the thing that you have to be a little bit concerned about, you always have to be concerned though with the UTG limper raising post flop and a limp pot on a board like this that they might have a big over pair that they were trying to limp re-raise. But a lot of times you're going to get a lot of folds. But I'm not going to call or raise here when it goes bet, raise, call. That flat call here is pretty strong, even though Chuck only has a six. And now Eric comes back and bet three bets. So whenever you see a, a weak lead followed by some sort of aggressive action and then a three bet action, that's really, really strong. And I think that this is actually a little bit of an over... It's not an overplay, but it's actually, again, a little bit too strong. Sometimes you actually have to massage these pots. Like I said, I'm a huge proponent of fast playing. Sometimes, though, you have to know how to, like, rein it in a little bit here. Um, you could just come back over the top and make it 60. If you feel the need, like you want a fast play, just size down. Like, if it went 10, 30, call, call... Why not just make it like 75? Build a pot up. If you make it 130, you're going to fold out a lot of different hands. Now, maybe Eric thought that seat six was going to have an overpair and never fold. I can only surmise, but that's how I think about it. Because the, the problem with sometimes calling from out of position is it's going to get checked through on the turn. So, I mean, could you call and lead turn like, you know, something that we don't normally see sure occasionally i guess you could call and lead turn but if you want to take the betting back with a fast play make the make the race small so we saw the set of fives there we saw that like weak lead and then three bet which is rarely going to be a bluff on six deuce deuce why not just click it up to 65 even though in an unbalanced way like you would never be bluffing there this is the way to make the most money at low stakes. I'd rather have you put the extra bet in and do it tiny than slow play from out of position, not get a bet, or make it so strong that basically no one, no one's really going to be able to call. Okay, this is 141. And this is a classic, classic low stakes type of deal here this particular hand. This was actually one of my favorites. It's going to win you some money here. So we've got, for whatever reason, he raises to a 15 with ace-8 offsuit from under the gun. Zach calls here ace-9 suited from plus one. Again, we haven't. I haven't seen anybody really three bet light here the entire time. So he makes the call. There is something to be said. I mean, you've got a suited ace here. You could certainly call and let people come in behind, overflush them, over trip them if you're deep. And also, sometimes they're going to come in even with weaker aces that you can get value from. He makes the call. Obviously, Phil shouldn't be calling. And Chuck here with like king queen off. I mean, he can. He's. It's kind of interesting because he's at like 40 blinds here, and it's 15 call call. If he was a little bit shorter, I guess he could shove here. He's incentivized. He can just call. So he makes the call here. I mean, when you're playing short, it's kind of weird, right? Like if this went, you know, 20 or 25 call, call, then I think shoving actually with king, queen would probably be a decent play, um, depending on how wide. I mean, once I saw somebody open ace-8 off from UTG, I think it would print. 
especially with the people v-pipping way, way too, way too wide behind here. So 10.58 here, it's going to get checked around. So, I mean, Robert opens to 15, small blind, big blind, plus one call, textured board, he decides to check it. Like if I had opened like ace eight of diamonds here, you know, maybe you check to check call. Again, if it's close, if there's less people and you're on the cusp, whether or not to bet a hand for value protection like an ace eight, you would want to favor the one that has the back door. So if you had ace eight of hearts here against two people, you would favor that one than the other ace eight suited that don't have a back door. If you're trying to pick which one is better. So it gets checked around, turns a seven. Six four has a straight. Don't know why Phil now remember the preflop razor positional awareness here is under the gun. Everyone checks the flop. If you're thinking about straightforward, small stakes, live no limit players, normally what's gonna happen is that once the preflop razor checks and the two guys here are in position, they're gonna bet with top pair plus. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't. It's a textured board. But you're very rarely going to see someone check a 10 here after the preflop razor has checked. So if I was somehow in the hand with Phil's hand, I would know that someone probably doesn't have a 10. The best way to extract now, because we don't want to necessarily go for a check raise, because everyone's somewhat weak, is just to come out and bet. And in an exploitable fashion, if we had turned a large draw, say we had, I don't know, ace nine of clubs, ace six of clubs, queen jack of clubs here, something like that, then we could go for a check raise. So it's like the value I want to come out and lead to decrease my fold equity and the draws, I want to make an aggressive action to increase my fold equity. So I would be leading here with 6-4. I'd also be leading with 2-pair and things like things that I don't think should be check-raised, per se. And the reason why I don't think, like say, for example, like a hand like 5-7 should be check-raised is you, you start to go too thin. If you start to check-raise 5-7, 6-4, I don't want people to fold out because <laughs> I've got, in essence, the nuts here. I mean, it's the third nut. But... And by the way, Jack-9 is probably going to bet off here, too, from the two field players after the preflop raiser check. So. so he decides to check... Robert now bets ace eight 20 bucks. Zach here has ace nine of spades. And again, it's kind of an interesting little spot because I think that he could raise here too as a semi bluff. It doesn't seem like the preflop raiser has a strong hand based upon bet sizing and based upon flop sizing too. You're next to act. So you've got two guys behind you. You need to drive out hands that might overcall with pairs. So I very well might take ace nine here as a turn, just semi-bluff raise against the preflop raiser that checked back this flop. If everybody's playing straightforward, he chooses to call. King queen is obviously going to get out of the way. And uh, this is like, the, like I said, you know, I was talking about this before, like small, fast play, like maybe, you know, what are you going to do here? The board is draw heavy. Are you check calling and then leading river? But I, if I had checked here, I'd just like make it like 45 or 50. You know, something like that. The draws are going to be very, very transparent. No one's really going to have a club draw. The people in position didn't bet it off. The preflop raiser is very rarely going to have a club draw. Really what you're concerned about is like a four, a nine, a jack filling, and uh, a six. I mean, those would be the only, I mean, those would be the cards that I, I mean, concerned of. So there's like four cards. So it's like, you know, one third of the deck or something like that. 20 call and he decides to call. Okay. This is why I like, I love this hand so much because it, again, it reminds me of like my old days. Rivers of three. Rivers of three. Okay. So six, four was already there on the turn, right? Three doesn't really change anything. You wouldn't think that a guy would have six, four. This guy just overcalled the flop. Excuse me, he overcalled the turn, right? Preflop razor bets, small. Guy from plus one calls. He calls. Now the river's a three. And my question to you here, with this sizing here at the end, which I believe he bet it'll come up here in a second, I think like a hundred. 
Oh, he bet 75, but even still, 75, half the size of the pot. What is the absolute minimum that he has here? Well, first of all, let's let's think if he had actually bet larger. So let's say it went check call, and now he came out and he bet like 110, 120. Into two people. Is that a club draw? I mean, you got to be, I mean, the guy's got to be really, really out there for this to be a bluff. Now, occasionally, you will see a guy sort of make a blocker bet here at the end, although I th- still think 75 is a little bit on the large side for a blocker bet. You might see a guy block out at the low stakes, 45 or 50 with a 10, but a number of things would have to happen for him to have a 10, right? He'd have to just, he'd have to check the turn and guys love to bet for protection. So you got to bring him back to the turn here too. But when he leads here for 75, you can't even beat a blocker bet by a 10 if you have ace eight here. Robert is next to act. I mean, this is the easiest fold in the world here. When someone check over calls the turn and then leads the river on a blank into multiple opponents, that is almost never a bluff. I mean, there are certain lines that are almost never a bluff. This is one of them. Almost never a bluff. And yeah, nothing's changed except the fact that the guy has bet, but sorry, this is just never going to be a bluff into into multi-way action here. And that's going to wrap it up for us. So we'll probably go at least one more episode here covering sort of the details of low stakes, possibly two. I'm going to be doing the CLP videos the next two weeks. Give me some feedback, guys from Northern Florida, everybody else. I think that you guys, uh, I'm, I'm hoping you're going to enjoy this like short little series. Thank you guys for once again being subscribers. And one other thing too, if you are new to the site, one of the best ways to search through the content is to go into a particular category like CLP videos, CLP podcasts, something like that, and search in the filter for different concepts, three betting, stakes, that's the best way to search through the site. Uh, Once again, thank you guys for being subscribers, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching this video. If you like what you've seen here, please hit the subscribe button. And of course, you can uh, check out training videos like this over at crushlivepoker.com.